Hello and welcome to Cops, Courts, and the Criminal Justice System, the second in a three-part series titled Finding Answers Together, Exploring, Explaining, and Eradicating Systemic Racism. This event is sponsored by the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion with support from the Center for Cultural Pluralism. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the University of Vermont is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples for thousands of years and is home of the Western Abenaki people. UVM honors, recognizes, and respects these peoples, especially the Abenaki, as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we virtually gather today. My name is Paul, he, him, his pronouns, and I serve as Senior Advisor for Strategic Diversity Assessment and Research in the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at UVM. And I will be serving as your host today. I'm joined by three of my colleagues who will now briefly introduce themselves. Stephanie. Stephanie, if you could please just uh, unmute your mic, please. I got caught, sorry. Uh, yes, thanks for introducing me. I'm Stephanie Seguino. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Vermont. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you for joining us today. Alec, if you could please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm honored to be here. My name is Alec Ewald, and I'm a political science professor uh, here at the University of Vermont. Thank you so much for joining us today as well. Sherwood. Hello, my name is Sherwood Smith. I use he, him pronouns. I am director for the Center for Cultural Pluralism and senior, uh, senior executive director for diversity and engagement at the University of Vermont. Thank you so much, Sherwood. We're glad to have you with us. So as we get going today, we'd like to go over a few logistics with you. So all participants are on mute by default. Only our presenters will be speaking during this event. We do encourage you to use the live question and answer feature to ask questions or share comments with other participants or with our presenters. We will do our best to answer your questions and address your comments during the session. However, we would like to acknowledge that given the time allotted for this event, we may not be able to address every question or comment we receive. This session is being recorded and the recording of the session will be available through our website within the next few days. Finally, this event is being live captioned by our colleagues at White Coat Captioning. Captions for this event are available at the stream text link shared in the event chat with all of you. So like our first session on systemic racism last week, our presenters will speak for about 30 minutes. We will then address as many questions or comments as we can, and we aim to end right around 1 p.m. with some closing remarks. At this moment, we'd like to go over just a few group agreements we'd like you to keep in mind. These agreements are one part of Glenn Singleton's Creators Conversations About Race Protocol. So the first is to stay engaged. There's a lot going on in the world right now, and we hope you will do your best to stay as engaged as possible with us throughout the entire session. The second is to speak your truth. We intend to share our research and expertise with you as authentically as possible, and we ask that you, particularly in chat, do your best to speak from your own personal experience. The third is to be open to experiencing dis some discomfort. Discomfort can be an important part of the learning process, and we encourage you to lean into that space. The fourth is to expect and accept non-closure. Given the complexity and magnitude of systemic racism, this session is part of an ongoing process, and we hope we are adding to your ability to gauge in it more effectively. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Sherwood, who will be providing you a brief review of systemic racism. Thank you, Paul. So I want to ground us in a basic understanding of systemic racism. 
For this particular session, one of the important things to understand is that systemic racism is very predictable. So one of the goals in working through this is to eliminate the racial predictability and disproportionality of which people in the US have access to legal services, are stopped or arrested by police, and receive differential treatments in the courts. Our speakers will talk more about this piece, but the one of the key factors of systemic racism is this predictability. Systemic racism is one of four different levels of racism. There are the cultural forms or societal forms of messages which we see through media, things like books, films, that sort of make and reinforce the assumptions of superiority and privilege. There is systemic racism, which operates through the laws, policies, and formal procedures that give advantage to whites and disadvantage to people of color. There is the most commonly talked about, the interpersonal. These are the ways prejudice and biases are expressed sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, as racist acts or shared ideas or assumptions between people. And lastly, there is internalized racism, in which folks of all racial groups have internalized these messages we've been given since our birth and internalize and believe them so that even myself as an African-American may have internalized certain negative stereotypes that I have been bombarded with throughout my life. So to summarize, Systemic racism is both structural and institutional. It's an interlocking set of parts that work together to create a systemic whole. It's an established way of doing things such that we come to see things done in this way as consistent, reasonable. We even assume it to be the normal way that things are done. And it does not require attention. It runs by itself such that it doesn't need the initiative of individual people or groups to maintain its influence. In summary, for this session, there are two key points to focus on. The criminal justice system plays a key role in establishing the social control and maintaining the power and dominance of economic classes. And the criminal justice contact that people have can seriously impact on a person's rights and life chances well beyond the simple sentencing imposed by the court or the lack of sentencing imposed by a court. I hope that helps us ground ourselves as we move on to hear from our excellent presenters. I pass it on to you, Stephanie. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that was a, an excellent introduction, Sherwood, and if you could put up my next slide. Uh, I want to just start by talking about the outcome of the criminal justice system, which we all now know has a significant impact on job probabilities uh, and employment, for example. So um, here is some data that looks at racial disparities in uh, the criminal justice system at various stages of it. And so groups are considered to be overrepresented if their share of the for example, the prison population is greater than their share of the population at large. And so what we see here is for African Americans at every level, whether it's in jail, death row population, life sentences, they are disproportionately represented in the uh, in the prison population. And, and one of our questions has to be, why is that? Uh, and when did that emerge? If I could have the next slide. The, the, Racial disparities in policing and criminal justice have been with us since slavery, but certainly the most recent period is related to the so-called war on drugs that began in the uh, 1980s. And you can see here uh, black and white drug arrest rates per 100,000 of the population. And we can see this begin to rise for whites in the 1980s, but very modestly actually, uh, overwhelmingly, the increase in mass incarceration re related to the war on drugs was uh, experienced by African Americans. And as you can see that uh, although blacks and whites use drugs at similar rates, the imprisonment rate of blacks for drug charges is six times greater than that of whites. Uh, if I could have the next slide. And so the question becomes, how does, you know, how does this, uh, how does this 
What are the features of the system that lead to this event? And I'm going to talk mostly about policing, but I wanted everybody to understand that the disparities that we see in the criminal justice system uh, follow a chain of causality in which there is are disparities at every stage. So in terms of policing, we see various uh, disparities in the search and stop rates of, uh, of, of drivers of, by race, and I'll show some data from Vermont, uh, as well as charging uh, suspects with various crimes. Prosecutors themselves have a great deal of discretion. They contribute to this. Uh, rules on bail and pre-trial detention have a significant effect. If people are uh, jailed uh, and do not get bail prior to detention, they're much more likely to accept a plea bargain that gives them time in jail than somebody who's already out of jail. Juries, of course, has been demonstrated by a, re uh, by a variety of data, uh, can be discriminatory, as, especially if they're overwhelmingly white. And of course, judges uh, d demonstrate these disparities. So this is, it's a long chain of causality, but uh, w really significant is the role of policing. If I could have the next slide. And, um, uh, actually, before I go on to that, let me just mention that uh, studies that have looked at uh, at racial disparities in sentencing control for legally relevant factors. Uh, and when they do that, we, st we still find that Blacks le receive sentences that are almost 20% longer than sentences of similarly situated whites. And in fact, that disparity grows the darker the skin of the suspect or the person who's been prosecuted. Next slide. Uh, and, and so there are a variety of explanations for this, and I, I want to talk about one that has more recently been discussed, and that is the role of implicit bias and racial stereotypes. That is these generalizations, which may or may not be accurate, about people with various types of phenotype uh, and, and skin tone. Uh, uh, and so what we see is that has been cultivated in the US as a result, I would argue, of, of uh, racism is negative stereotypes of people of color and relatively positive stereotypes of whites. And so this acts as a stealth factor. We have all internalized this, as Sherwood said, and it affects our everyday decision making, even if we're not conscious of it. Next slide. Uh, and in particular, what we find is that black men are strongly associated with threat or aggression, uh, and that this impacts our ability to accurately, accurately assess behaviors of people, whether it's in policing or other, other, uh, in other aspects of society. Um, next slide. So one of the things I think is interesting is that in Vermont, we often think that we're immune from racial bias. We think of ourselves as a liberal progressive state and uh, very frequently people uh, will intimate that these issues of racial bias do not exist in Vermont. We were able, my colleague and I, Nancy Brooks, were able to interrogate that with data that was now required by the state to be collected by law enforcement agencies. And what I think is significant about uh, traffic stop data is that traffic policing is the most frequent opportunity that we have as members of the public to interact with the police. And because these generate large data sets, we can make inferences about racial differences and racial discrimination in policing that I think are a canary in the coal mine, gold, uh, coal mine that really are, are likely to be indicative of racial bias we find in other places in the criminal justice system and in society at large. And so we were able to look at this with roughly a half a million traffic stops in Vermont and we looked at a variety of different indicators uh, of where there might be racial disparities. So we asked, are black and brown drivers stopped at rates that are greater than their share of the driving population? Are they arrested at higher rates than white drivers? Are they searched at higher rates? And we also look at hit rates. Hit rates are the percentage of searches that yield contraband. Uh, I'll say a bit more about hit rates uh, in a few moments because that actually really allows us not only to identify racial disparities, but also racial bias. Next slide. 
So uh, uh, this uh, this slide here uh, maybe is a little complicated to interpret, but I'm gonna I'll help you here. Uh, this is all of the towns in our study. You can see there's so many of them; they all show up by name. And the red line tells us that uh, the bars, the green bars, would reach exactly that line if the blacks as a share of stop drivers was exactly equal to blacks as a share of drivers on the road. So we would expect absent bias, absent a variety of other factors that uh, if blacks are 5% of the popula driving population, they'd be 5% of drivers stopped. Uh, but what we see here is that blacks are overstopped by almost all of the agencies in our study in Vermont and by a significant uh, extent. So if you look at, for example, Vergen, Vergen is stopping black drivers at three times their share of the population. Uh, and uh, in fact, these numbers are significantly higher than the disparities that we find in places such as, let's say, Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, I, I put the graph of the Asians uh, below this. I didn't quite label it. I'm sorry, I missed uh, the label on that. But the graph below that is Asian drivers. And what is so striking about this is that Asian drivers are understopped relative to their share of the driving population in almost every uh, law enforcement agency in our study. And it really points to what we learned from critical race theory, which is that the greatest discrimination has been reserved for people with darker skin tones, and in particular, African Americans and Hispanics, whereas Asians are typically treated as a sort of model minority, if you will. And these data are consistent with that. Next slide. Something else we found in our study is that black drivers are arrested at twice the rate of white and Asian drivers. Uh, and there are a variety of reasons for that, that. It's a more complicated discussion. So I'd like to go to the next slide, which talks about search rates. Police officers have a lot of discretion on whom they stop and whether they decide to search a vehicle or not to search a vehicle. And quite frankly, whether they decide to give you a ticket or arrest you. Uh, and so what, one of the things that we found that was very striking in Vermont that black drivers are much more likely to be searched than white drivers. So what you see here is the ratio of black search rates to white search rates. And in Burlington at this time, black drivers were 350% more likely to be searched than white drivers. Rutland significantly greater than that at 625%. And you can see Vermont State Police at 466% and Williston at 227. Now, just to mention, Williston looks good relative to the others, but that's still a great disparity in search rates. And often, you know, what officers will say when you ask them about this or when they testify in court is that the, the, the signal that they got that they should search the driver is that the driver looked nervous. Um, but one of the things that we can ask is, well, were these productive searches? In other words, were their criteria sound? Uh, were they, in fact, likely to find evidence? And so we can look at the hit rates, the percentage of searches that yield contraband to figure that out. And if you could show me the next slide. And, and what we found was, I think, really striking. It's been found in other states in the country. And that is, in fact, that uh, black drivers are much less likely to be found with contraband that leads to a ticket or an arrest. And so this is suggestive either of over-searching of black drivers or under-searching of white drivers. And you, know, you would expect over time that if officers continue to search black drivers and don't find contraband, they would say, well, maybe, you know, maybe the criteria I'm using are, are too little and that my threshold of evidence is too little and I should search fewer black drivers and search for, you know, look for uh, uh, evidence or signals that are more stringent than the ones that I've been using. And if they don't, we, we think of that as sort of a taste for discrimination or personal bias. So this is really uh, the, the state of the art test of racially biased policing. And as, a, as you can see here, we see it in some of the largest agencies in Vermont. Next slide. So when, I, when I, I've done ride alongs with police officers from all over the state, uh, yields a lot of interesting stories and information. Uh, and one of the things that they say to me when I ask about the search rate disparities is they say, well, you know, we, we believe it's black and brown drivers that are bringing in drugs from out of state. And that's what explains the search rate disparities. Now, we are not able to get data on what the contraband found is in most from most law enforcement agencies, but we wanted to test that. It's a stereotype. That's an example of a stereotype that biases behavior. 
And so we asked the Vermont State Police, who were very, uh, very uh, cooperative and looked at their 2016 data, and we asked them to categorize the contraband that they found into various types. It could have been cigarettes on a 16 year old, an open container of beer, for example, stolen goods and so forth. And what we did was we separated out those cases in which uh, there was uh, there was, you know, what I would call serious uh, illegal drugs, heroin, cocaine and opioids. And what we found was that 100 percent of the searches that yielded that kind of contraband was of white drivers. And so it, it distinctly contradicts this negative stereotype. And I think it, it gives us some evidence of how these stereotypes can in fact influence behavior. And in fact, when I showed these results to a police chief in Vermont, her response to me was, well, Vermont State Police data must be inaccurate because all I see on television is black, black, uh, blacks and, and brown people being arrested for drugs. And I think that really is a central part of the story here. Could I have the next slide? And so uh, I, I think what, what I see in all of this is that Vermont is really no different than other states. Uh, these data that we see are very consistent across the country. Uh, and in fact, uh, here in this slide, what you see is the ratio of black to white search rates uh, in various jurisdictions across the country. The higher the, the number, uh, that is the more that it exceeds one, which would mean no discrimination. Uh, the more it succeeds one, the greater the racial disparity and likely racial bias in policing. And as you can see in the far left, we have North Carolina State Police at 1.5. So black drivers are 50% more likely to be searched. And up in the right hand corner, we some some of the worst disparities in a state that is predominantly white. And I, I think that suggests to us that we are not immune. Uh, in fact, that we have some deep searching to do around policing behavior especially because as, as Alec is going to talk about in a moment, the collateral consequences of involvement with the criminal justice system, where the police are the door to that involvement, have, have really negative consequences uh, in many aspects of life, not just policing and not just paying a citation and so forth, but in access to a job and voting and so forth. Uh, can you give me the next slide? Uh, and finally, just one last comment, because this has been so much in the discussion lately, is maybe these disparities are due to, uh, to uh, what we would call bad apples, that there are individuals that are driving up these numbers. Our data show that that's not the case. Could I have the next slide? When we first got our traffic stop data, the, uh, the police were not required to give us officer level data, but some did. And uh, they've stopped doing that. Uh, and so we no longer have this. But for our initial study, we had data on uh, officer level data. And what you see here again is the bar, the brown bar tells you that uh, the officers are stopping black drivers at the same rate that blacks are driving in the population. Anything above that means that black drivers are overstopped relative to their share of the driving population and under means understopped. Uh, anything less than the, uh, below the bar. And as you can see, this is the Bennington Police Department, which has been in the news quite a bit late, lately, and uh, a majority of officers are overstopping. Could I have the uh, next slide? And here is the Burlington Police Department. Here too, what we see is that this is, uh, it's not individual officers that are causing the disparities at the agency level, but rather, uh, I think many of us link this to culture. Uh, and leadership uh, in those places where there's strong leadership and there's a culture that's an anti-bias culture, I think you'll see different outcomes. But uh, it is certainly cannot be attributed to bad apples that if we got rid of them on the police force would solve all of our problems. Last slide. Great, so thank you so much. That was uh, my uh, thoughts on this and I turn this over to Alec Ewald. Um, thank you, um, Professor Seguino. Uh, Stephanie, that was a remarkable presentation. I'm still trying to trying to absorb it. Um, I want to shift to uh, in the balance of most of what I talk about um, to um, a much later part of the criminal justice process, which, um, as Paul Yoon mentioned, and as, as uh, Sherwood Smith told us as well, is, is a very complex and kind of multi step um, uh, process. Um, if, and, and Paul, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, because I did want to kind of echo and just say a little bit about the language that we're using here 
Um, and academics are kind of justly infamous for, uh, you know, focusing too much perhaps on language in certain settings and getting in fights about words that don't matter. Uh, but these really do, and they're, it's really important to understand uh, some of the different functions of this. Um, Professor James uh, Foreman Jr. in his brilliant book, um, Locking Up Our Own, he starts with this conundrum that he really wrestled with. Uh, he was a public defender in Washington, D.C. He defended a young African-American man. It hadn't gone well. And he was looking around the courtroom and realizing not only are the two of us uh, black, people of color, but so is the judge and so is the prosecutor and so are the bailiffs and so is the police chief and so are most of the city council. It, it, how do I make sense of this? And today, this is something that a lot of us are wrestling with too. If you see mayors, uh, whether it's de Blasio uh, or police chiefs, um, and in some, in some cities, the police themselves, who might identify as anti-racist and as reformers, um, but are, are the indisputable results, as Professor Seguino showed, are terribly and damagingly discriminatory. That's the function or one of the purposes of this language, of talking about structural or systemic racism. And I just, I think it's so important to understand it as different. And of course there are, you know, you, I hope you caught that Professor Seguino was very careful in trying to delineate sort of different types and what different types of evidence supports and doesn't support. But one element of talking about systemic uh, racism is to distinguish it from uh, what Sherwood Smith referred to with regard to kind of interpersonal or conscious supremacist views. Um, so you can go to the next slide, um, um, Paul, thank you very much, but um, it, it's not soft to speak of systemic or structural racism. It's still very much a call uh, to action. I also wanted to say just quickly, and again, Professor Seguino mentioned this as well in some of her early slides, um, but our focus as it should be today, uh, nationally and today in this session, um, is on race um, and, and the, the damaging and terrible kind of inequities that you see with, on along lines of race. Um, but it's really race and place. It's really race and poverty. Um, as we sort of people move to understanding the, the, the broader and complex shape of American racial discrimination and American um, punishment generally, um, about two thirds of the people in prison come from the lowest slice of the income distribution. So Paul, you can go to the next slide, but I think that was really important just to kind of register that if you want to talk about that in terms of intersectionality or if you're just sort of able to have that aware. So beyond the sentence, and again, I'm going to keep going back to Professor Seguino's presentation because it was so important. If I'm stopped, if I'm arrested, if I'm charged, um, if I'm, if I go to court, if I wind up getting a conviction, each of those interactions can leave a mark um, on my record, can build a criminal record for me. Something like 75 million Americans have a criminal record of some kind. And beyond the sentence in time and beyond the sentence in space, these collateral consequences or invisible punishments can have very serious damaging effects on people's citizenship status, people's individual lives, people's life chances. Um, very important, you don't have to go to prison to suffer these. Um, a conviction, a felony conviction is the most common threshold, um, but because they're not formally defined as punishments, there's almost never an obligation for courts or prosecutors or even my defense counsel to let me know that they might come with a conviction. And they can be added 10 or 20 years later and I is still affected by them, which is also not true if they are formally defined as punishments. And finally, Paul, you can go to the, last, the, the next slide, but this last point, these are imposed on broad classes of offenders. They're not like offense specific. So I'm not talking about you are convicted of a firearms violation and you lose your gun rights. I'm talking about people who are convicted of any kind of felony. It's really important here to use person first language. And I assume that a lot of people involved in this conversation today are familiar with the, the sort of dehumanizing impact of, of using um, uh, non-person first language. But here there's also a second reason, and there's some really good research, by the way, about the impact in this specific setting of person first language, which perhaps we could talk about more later. But there's also the accuracy element of this. And these 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 bullets in the slide are a little, little bit mixed up. But here's the thing. Having a charge or having a conviction that's later expunged, I might still suffer some of these civil or collateral consequences, even if I haven't been convicted technically of a felony. So if you hear me say people with criminal justice backgrounds or people with records or justice involved individuals, it's not I'm not just using person first language for the sake of using person first language. It's that collateral consequences, including some serious ones, affect people 
even people who do not have felony convictions. So some collateral consequences, you can move on now, Paul, thank you. Some collateral consequences in some places might affect a person even without a felony conviction or perhaps without a conviction at all. I wanted to be sure to note in some of the brilliant literature on so-called collateral damage or the collateral impact of American punishment, you see some of these areas and these are a little bit different from collateral sanctions as I'm defining them terrible impact on families. And I did want to note, right, that please, please take note of these remarkable disparities here. About one in 60 white kids have an incarcerated parent. About one in nine African-American kids have an incarcerated parent. So there's terrible impact on families of, of mass punishment. Um, LFOs, legal financial obligations, after Ferguson, this bega began to draw the kind of scrutiny that it needs to draw. People whose lives are terribly damaged by having fines and fees and surcharges, everything from being required to pay for your own DNA test to so-called pay to stay laws where you're charged for being in jail and charged for being on probation by the day as if it were a motel, this is very common. Individual and communal alienation from the kinds of policing and the kinds of punishment people experience. And then, and again, we can talk more about this if people want in the Q&A, the United States is a difficult time measuring our unemployment rate accurately because so many people might have their ability to get a job affected by their conviction. Same thing with census. People are counted as living in the prison town, which skews the map of the country in a legal, in a literal legal way. Same thing with voter turnout figures where people, and Paul, you can move on, but where people are unable to vote because they're barred from voting, it makes it hard for us to get. So these are some of the sort of collateral impacts that are beyond laws. Now, there are two areas that are really in a class by themselves where there's a sp specific group or I say class in the sort of legal sense of that term, um, people who are not citizens, including legal non-citizens, legal permanent residents, green card holders, are routinely deported. Um, this uh, really ramped up under President Obama has, and has accelerated even faster in the last few years, routinely deported for, even for misdemeanors, let alone it's absolutely certainty that if you're convicted of a felony, again, one more time, I'm talking about legal non-citizens who are people who are here legally, are deported for uh, criminal justice involvement. Second, people convicted of crimes that are classified as sexual offenses face um, massive and, and life-changing requirements to register um, and to live in certain places. These are two categories of offenses that I think are, are, are worth identifying for their severity and there's some other elements that they're legally different too. Okay, Paul, if we could move on. So, so here comes the list. So these are the kind of collateral sanctions or the collateral consequences. These vary by state. Almost everything I'm going to sprint through here with apologies varies by state in the United States. Housing, in fact, varies locally as well. Private landlords can run background checks, can uh, exclude somebody from a property, can evict somebody from a property, um, and uh, uh, as well as public landlords, sitting housing authorities have the legal authority to evict people or exclude them to protect the health, safety, and well-being of other residents. Many localities, including uh, Burlington, um, are actually moving towards case-by-case -case determinations and are no longer using blanket exclusions of people with backgrounds. But under federal law, um, and of course housing is so complex, but under federal law, local and state housing authorities routinely exclude people because of their criminal justice in involvement uh, from housing. Benefits. Under a federal law, states are required, let me try to say this slowly and clearly because it's quite complicated and still a little mind boggling to me. Under a federal law enacted in the 1990s, states were required to exclude drug felons only, not people convicted of other types of crime, even if they were serious felonies, drug felons only, people convicted of drug felonies, um, from uh, welfare benefits, TANF, uh, or SNA and SNAP benefits, food stamps, or opt out. So states have the ability to decide, uh, we don't actually want to do that. A number of states right away said, that doesn't seem like a good idea to us at all, um, and opted out of these restrictions. But a lot of states have some type of restriction. You have to wait a year. You have to go through a program. You have to pass testing. You have to show up six times at this office and this office and that office before people can get food stamps and before people can get um, cash benefits. Those rules really vary by state. In most of the, of the Northeast, for whatever it's worth, um, neither of those restrictions is in place. New Jersey does have some restrictions. And finally, parenting itself. Of course, in individual cases, people are determined to be, quote, unfit. 
um, because of criminal justice involvement, but there are also now restrictions on someone's ability to adopt or to be a guardian um, if they have a conviction. Uh, those are very, quite discretionary, and Paul, you can move on. Uh, those are also quite complex and kind of discretionary case-by-case -case determinations. Um, the employment setting so important and so consequential. Private employers, again, going back to Professor Seguino's presentation, imagine I get arrested and imagine I get charged, but the charges are later dropped. I apply for a job, someone runs a background check on me, and when she gets my background from one of these massive private vendors, she just sees a bunch of stuff in language she might not understand, but she knows I got arrested and I got charged, and there's some nasty language in there about things that I might have done. Even if I didn't get convicted of crime, she might say, I'm going to give this guy a pass. There's also a lot of errors in those records. Maybe I was convicted, but it was later expunged. Maybe I was convicted, but it was later changed to a different kind of offense. Those records are not often updated and not often cleaned. Um, private employers can ask all sorts of questions on the application in many jurisdictions about a background. Many jurisdictions, uh, again, including Vermont, now have so-called ban the box laws, but it's very important. The name is a bit of a misnomer. It really just postpones the question. The employer can always still ask me later on and can always still reject me because of a conviction if the employer determines there's a connection between what I did, what I was convicted of doing, and the job and passage of time and considering rehabilitation. But a number of jurisdictions have really made progress in, in limiting what employers can do in the employment setting. Final note on this, some of the best research in this whole area in the last few years, this brilliant article, I'll try to keep this short, the military does take people with conviction backgrounds. This is varied by service, it varies by time. But some sociologists got the Army's records and found that people with felony convictions made great soldiers. They said, look, this is the country's biggest employer. And uh, they looked at the records and found that people were promoted at least as fast as similarly situated uh, other soldiers. So the military does exclude people for sure because of a conviction. Uh, local recruiters play a role. Um, this is a really important sort of element of this landscape. And Paul, you can move on, but this is an important sort of, again, I re really recommend that study to people. Um, so college, higher education, this law has been moderated since it's, um, if I may, it's insane earlier version. But it's still the case that if I were at UVM um, receiving um, federal student aid and I got a drug conviction, um, my access to that loan would probably be suspended or forfeited. Um, if I went through a program, if some time passed, right, and I took some tests, I could probably regain the access to those um, federal student loans. Of course, campuses are free to exclude people, applicants with records, but it's very important to note here, a number of colleges, and I'm proud to say through the work of Kathy Fox, um, and colleagues here at UVM, um, we're one of the universities that now offers four credit classes in Vermont's um, uh, facilities, Vermont's, um, in, in Vermont's jails and prisons. Um, four credit UVM courses are taught uh, here in, in UVM prisons um, by some of my Vermont uh, UVM colleagues. And Paul, you can, you can move on from there. Um, um, I think we've got uh, voting rights on the next slide. And of course, this has drawn a great deal of attention. And I want to emphasize variation here because this is a really important element of this landscape. Two states, Vermont and Maine, have no restriction. People vote and do by absentee ballot in the town of former residents. I've talked to town clerks about this. It's quite routine. The numbers are lower than we wish they were. But Vermonters vote from prison um, in state, local, national elections. There are 17 states, including some very large ones, where only prisoners are disqualified. I should have mentioned this earlier. Remember, most people convicted of felonies are not sentenced to prison. They're sentenced to probation. And in a lot of big states, people on probation and on parole, which is supervision after prison, usually, are eligible to vote. In 18 states, uh, people who are on parole and probation are not eligible, and there are still about a dozen states um, where at least some people, maybe it's a second offense or maybe it's a particular kind of conviction, uh, are restricted from voting for a while or indefinitely after the sentence. Um, but again, I put this in italics in the slide because it's a very, it's a, this is a deeply comp complicated element of this sort of working on these issues. Most Americans with felony convictions are indeed eligible to vote. A lot of government officials don't know that, and a lot of the people who are affected by it don't know that either. 
jury service, another core element of American citizenship. You have a right to a jury by a fair cross section of your community. But in a lot of communities in the United States, a huge portion, especially of young black men, are excluded from eligibility for jury service uh, because of a, a, a criminal conviction. Um, there are a lot of states where you might be able to get that the right to be eligible back, but you can still get struck for cause. Um, so this is a, there's not enough research on this area. Um, as you know, most convictions come from plea deals anyway, um, but still jury service, critical element, and you can move on, Paul, to the next slide. But voting rights and jury service, deeply important elements of American citizenship that are also affected by a conviction. In a lot of rural America, this is actually the most important restriction of all. We know very little about this, but from some interviews and from some other research, when a lot of people in rural America who hunt or for whom it's a really important sort of part of their of their life and of their social experience, right, and what they do with their families, um, under federal law, um, you lose uh, the right to own a gun if you ha have a felony conviction, but states restore those rights. Um, uh, I, I struck this from my uh, some of the slide in the interest of space, but there was a Supreme Court case about 10 years ago um, when some Supreme Court justices themselves admitted they had not understood this, that many states restore a person's right to own guns um, automatically after the passage of time or with very relatively easy documents to obtain, whereas others do not. So if I have a felony conviction, my firearms rights really vary depending on where I live and what those rules are. Um, and there's this again, is, there's plenty of parts of the country when uh, uh, where this is a really important sort of thing and not just in white rural America, but often in communities where people feel a strong right to self-defense. Uh, the next slide here and uh, move to wrap up here um, in just a couple of minutes. Um, and I just I want to close with this language because a lot of people who, who have written and who are pushing for reform um, and through litigation and legislation on these issues have really said, look, if a person has has a conviction in the United States or has been involved with the justice system, um, we really need to think of them. And Michelle Alexander has used this language. It, it's really a creation of a caste as strong as that language is because you so many of these rights and privileges are diminished. It's internal exile or it's civil death. Um, at the same time, there's so much variation, there's so much discretion in these rules um, that what we really have is the system where some doors may open for some people in some places. Um, discretion and discrimination travel together, as a late great law professor once observed, and so this is a problem. But I did want to close on the note that this variation is a problem in many respects, but it's also an opportunity for reform because there's, there's, there's opportunity for pressure and for change in so many localities and so many states in many of these different areas. Um, so that's my, that's my sprint through the landscape of collateral sanctions, and I, I look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ewald. Thank you so much, Dr. Seguino, as well. We know that there are a bunch of questions that have come in from all of you, and we're going to try to get to those uh, right away here. I believe that the first question is going to be going to Dr. Seguino. And Dr. Seguino, if you could just make sure that your uh, mic is unmuted. One more time. <laughs> uh, I am looking at the question here. Um, the question was, Is uh, am I going to mention that I was targeted by the Burlington Chief of Police in social media through social media for daring to share this information publicly? Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, the question mentioned it, so I don't need to, um, but I will comment on it. I, I, you know, I am hopeful that we are at a different stage with the George Floyd uh, killing and protest that uh, and the outpouring of stories in across the United States of, uh, of terrible interactions with the police, that the Vermont, the Vermont police will begin to listen more uh, to the stories of people, of, of citizens and to be willing to engage in a process of self-reflection as compared to defensiveness about the data. Um, so uh, that, that would be my response to that. Thanks. Um, hi, this is Alec. I, sorry, I see that my 
uh, I think my the camera and mic are both on now. Um, so I, I think I see a question here, and just so folks know, we're, we're working with a, with a chat um, simultaneously here. Um, a, a good question, because I, I blew right past my mention of, of place. Um, and there's a couple of different things there, but when I refer to race and place, there's a, a few different sort of elements of this. At the general level, simply the, the central fact of variation in everything from, and again, I'm standing on the shoulders of Professor Seguino's sort of really important list here, but it, the formal laws that are different in different jurisdictions in almost all of the areas that I mentioned, the nature of policing in all of those different uh, those kinds of jurisdictions, um, and also the way that different locations are policed in the literal sense. And I do think it's worth pointing out here on college campuses, um, not to put too fine a point on it, um, a person can be drunk and disorderly and walk around screaming epithets, and it's sort of smiled on as silly, young, and foolish behavior, whereas that's several crimes in other, in other kinds of jurisdictions. Another element of place is that when the sociologists measure um, percentages of people that have convictions with all of the kinds of impact that we're seeing, um, it is indeed certain localities where you see that. And again, and I, this has tremendous impact with, uh, on, on things, again, like jury selection. Um, if you're in Newark and you're a young black man and you're facing a jury trial, you're not seeing a jury that's a fair cross section um, of that community. So, and again, I have to mention here our, our geography department, um, which has some really sort of uh, terrific scholars who work on this, uh, on the sort of geographical sort of place-based elements of this. So uh, that would be my my response to that one. I see that the next there's another question for me, and that is, what is the historical origin of police in the United States? There are a variety of uh, approaches to answering this question. Uh, I think it's important to understand that in, in many degrees, policing in the United States has been about social control and punishment. Uh, there are other approaches such as public safety and well-being of the community uh, but really, in, in some ways, the origins of policing in the United States, the first origins were in slave patrols uh, to capture uh, ca uh, escaped uh, African-Americans who were in, enslaved. And uh, later, of course, policing was used to quell labor unrest, uh, rest of striking workers on behalf of corporations. So uh, I would say that in general, the the role of policing has been more about social control for the benefit of the dominant group, whether that's the economic group or a racial group, uh, and that we are really in a moment currently of re redefining the role of policing. I think that's deeply what we're engaged in as a result of the protests against George Floyd's killing, and I hope that we continue in that process. Um, I want to thank whoever has asked this next question as well, because it's a really great question. The question is, um, wouldn't we expect, shouldn't we expect, I think is the, is the point, shouldn't we expect, quote, case by case determination to lead to more uh, racial disparity? Um, and, and I had mentioned how I, I, I assume the question is responding to, I think I, I spoke positively of moving towards case by case determination in the housing setting. This is a very perceptive, very important very difficult problem to wrestle with. And I want to step back before answering the, the immediate sort of question here, which is part of the you know, 30 years ago, well, sorry, always add 10 years, 40 years ago, when there was a, a, a real drop in support for rehabilitative um, punishments in the United States and for discretionary sentencing and discretionary procedures generally, part of the attack on discretion came from this observation. That is the questioner's observation, which is people who were concerned about inequality and who were saying, it looks to us like discretion is bad. It looks to us like discretion and case-by-case -case determinations are having damaging, unfair, unequal, disproportionate results. Um, that was part, part of why we got um, mandatory minimums. 
um, that was part of why we got more rigid sentencing laws with the horrible excesses that they have led to. So what we need to do is figure out how to get rid of automatic bars in settings like employment. You can't become a home health aide, for example, if you've got a certain kind of conviction. You can't live in public housing if you have a certain kind of conviction. We have to get rid of those automatic barriers while doing a better job of having discretionary procedures and sort of, I don't know, the language trying to control for, trying to be vigilant about, having scrutiny by academics and by litigators of the results trying to get to case by case determination. Again, as I mentioned, and I'm almost done, but as I mentioned at the end, this is this brilliant observation by the late um, William Stunts, discrimination and discretion tend to travel together. So discretion is better than an absolute bar, uh, but it absolutely can can lead to, to racial disparity without vigilance and without a uh, good kind of safeguard. So thank you for that question. The next question uh, is also an excellent one. It asks, how much does media pl uh, play a role in creating the image of Blacks as being bad people? That's a great question. And I want to just affirm that especially, I think, for young people, media consumption can be an important vehicle by which they learn this. But truthfully, I have to tell you that this is an everyday thing that happens in all of our systems. Um, several years ago, my son was, he was in school at Edmonds Middle School. He came home one day and told me a hate crime had been committed and I asked him about it and he described to me a scenario in which there were two boys in class, one was white and one was black, both were acting up, nothing serious but just being kids and the, the teacher only sent the black boy to the principal's office and I think it's instructive that he, he experienced that as a hate crime. So it's, it's also everyday acts that we see uh, walking down the street and women clutching their pocketbooks when they walk by a person of color, for example. All of those messages uh, transmit to us developing and internalizing these negative stereotypes. I, I also think that, you know, I, I think that we have to often think about the role that the media play in terms of who funds the media uh, and what purpose that serves. And uh, so, you know, in the, the show Cops, for example, um, what is that reflecting and who is funding that? Who are the people that are profiting from that kind of show? So there's a relationship between uh, social control and social uh, disparate power in our political and economic system that is reflected by the media. So you, I don't think we can say the media caused the problem. They are more a mirror of institutional and systemic racism and a variety of other institutions, but certainly uh, a more obvious one in terms of how we get delivered this information of so-called uh, black criminality. Um, there's a question and with apologies, Professor Seguino, I, I, I might hand this right back to you because um, there's, there's a question about concrete solutions that I think is really concerned with uh, reforms to policing specifically. And of course, I've been following and engaging in some of this conversation. There's a really good um, uh, group eight that can't wait about some specific reforms to policing, uh, the, the kinds of immunity that police involve and the kinds of protocols that about their, their specific uses of force and things that are prohibited and things about bystander rules within the police force. But I, I think the question really is about you know, what kind of actual reforms can we push for in policing generally and then specifically here in Vermont? And you're just much better qualified to sort of comment on that. So. It, it, I, Thanks, Alec. I, I, I don't know about better qualified, but I have done done a lot of talking to police chiefs in Vermont. Um, you know, the data for me actually is very important. I, I often think of the data as uh, giving us feedback on our behaviors that we're not aware of. And you know, similarly, if you go to the, you get on the scale and you realize you weigh more than you thought you did, it gives you feedback to adjust your behavior. So I think data is an important step. One of the things that we find in Vermont is that the police agencies simply don't use the data. Uh, but uh, beyond that, you know, what I find is most significantly important is the role of leadership, and therefore hiring police chiefs that are committed to eradicating this problem, upholding this as a goal and using all of the tools at their disposal to do that, whether it's at the training phase, the hiring phase, or the monitoring phase uh, of, of police officers and their actions. So I wanna just give you one example that I think is instructive. Um, a police agency in Vermont shared with me that there was a complaint against a, 
an officer of racial bias uh, against a black family that uh, he had stopped. They called the officer in. They pulled the uh, video of his car stop before this black family and after. In the, in the first car was a white family. He walks up and he says, this is my name. Here's my, um, introduced himself. This is the reason I stopped you and very politely continued with the, with the um, interaction. Uh, and then it came to the black vehicle, a family. He walks up and he says, do you have any drugs or weapons in this car? And then the next uh, video was of a white family in which he approached very politely. What was interesting to me was that the officer was not even aware of this behavior. So I think that using data, holding ourselves accountable uh, are, are important ways to do this. And I, I think there's another comment I hear, see here that also relates to about policing in general. Is it uh, necessary or unnecessary? I mean, partly what we have to do is to rethink policing, which is not about a warrior mentality, us against them and social control, but I think has to be about wellness and public safety. And it means that you, if that is the goal of your police department, you will attract a different type of person to the, uh, to the police department. Finally, let me just say one other thing about training. We have a, a training system that I think is deeply flawed. Uh, there was a woman who went to the Vermont Police Academy who um, was ready to drop out because it was so warrior-like and militaristic and it wasn't what she had signed up for. Uh, so in many ways, the training excludes the kind of people that we would want to have do policing. Uh, if you go to a country like Norway, four years of training is required uh, as compared to 16 weeks here. And that requires a full year of, of uh, psychology study. Uh, one might argue that study on racial history, uh, on gender inequality and inequality in general and our criminalization of poverty might be precepts that would be in, uh, included in training that would shape, would, that would help officers to some extent undo their own biases. So I'll leave it at there, but I think those are some examples. Um, uh, there's a, a question has come in. I want to thank the person who posed this question. It's kind of this cumulative, um, you know, scenario person who's, who's wrongfully convicted is not able to expunge the conviction, which is a wrongful conviction, and then sees their employment um, prospects uh, limited, including perhaps uh, the idea of working at a university. Um, and the, the question, you know, intentionally or otherwise, sort of contains some of the reforms within it. So, of course, better, you know, better prevention of wrongful convictions for which there are a variety of kind of approaches for reforms um, that we need to look at. But again, expungement which is sort of a fancy word for erasure, expungement rules vary by state. And um, there's a, actually a fair bit of advocacy and reform and research pu pushing on this, people who are trying to make expungement automatic. So one thing I would really mention to people, and I can explain this in a little bit more detail, although our time is running out, if you make it hard for people to do something, we've all experienced here the kind of bandwidth drain of needing to deal with technology and having there be a plague Right? And when you've got a conviction and you're having a hard time getting figuring things out and you have to show up right, and you're facing other challenges in your life, um, it, it's difficult to get an expungement. You have to get a form, you have to get approval from a judge perhaps, you have to get probation, you have to pass testing. Making expungement automatic, at least for certain offenses, is a really promising reform um, that some uh, jurisdictions have, have been moving towards. Second, with regard to employers, limiting employers' ability to reject somebody um, because of their background. For example, limiting it only to a conviction or only to a certain kind of conviction, or as in jurisdictions like New York saying, no, the burden is on you, employer. You may not reject somebody unless, boom, 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 the conviction is related to the job, uh, not enough time has passed, there's no evidence. So flipping the language of so the burden is on the employer um, rather than on the applicant. Um, and then finally, cleaning up records cleaning up criminal records. There's different statutory ways to do this, require the private vendors of employment records to clean their records more often, give people the same way you can get your credit score, enable everybody to see their record for free, set up government offices that help people fix their records where there are errors in them. This is this stuff is all on nonprofits these days. We're trying to help people out. So those are, that was a great compound question. And those are a few things that we can have, uh, that we can push towards. Thank you. Uh, I see one last question here, and that is, do police departments have mandatory diversity and equity training? Uh, I really believe in training. The training I have seen, however, is inadequate. 
And what is what it, what the research shows is that it's not just a one-time training that matters, but short and frequent trainings uh, that really do matter. Uh, and uh, so in many ways, in some police departments in Vermont, there are trainings, but in others there are not. I don't see anything at the state level that mandates it, nor any guidance on the trainings that do happen. Thank you so much, Dr. Seguino. Thank you so much, Dr. Ewald and Dr. Smith as well. I am so sorry to say that unfortunately, that is all the time we have today for your wonderful questions. I know that there are many more that we weren't able to get to, uh, and we apologize that we weren't able to. I wanted to take a moment just on behalf of the Division of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and the Center for Cultural Pluralism, excuse me, to just thank all of you again for attending today's Teach It. I'd also like to thank our three presenters, all of the people behind the scenes, like our moderators and our producer for helping to put this together. So this Teach In series concludes next Wednesday, July 1st, uh, same time, same place. And we hope you will join us for that event too. If you'd like more information or for resources, for further education, please go to the URL. Um, it should be shared with you in our announcements, but it's go.uvm.edu slash amazinggrace, and you should be able to see it on your screen as well. Finally, um, we would really appreciate it if you just took one minute, please, to complete our short evaluation for this event. This would really help us get a better sense of what you learned and gleaned from this, as well as what we could be doing better for next session as well. So thank you all so much again. Please be well and take care.